Okay, we might make a start. Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Dan Gosher. I'm the Director of Climate and Environment at ACCR. It is uh, custom in Australia to acknowledge the country from which you're, you're calling from. Um, and I'm on the land of the Gadigal people uh, of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, welcome to this webinar uh, from ACCR, where we will discuss uh, the climate uh, plans of Rio Tinto and Glencore, um, both of which are coming up to votes at their AGMs in a couple of weeks' time. Um, just some housekeeping, this uh, webinar is being recorded, so if you don't want your name shown on the recording, uh, please submit questions anonymously. Other than that, uh, quickly through the agenda, I'll talk quickly to the sound climate uh, mechanism itself. Harriet Cater, um, uh, ACCR's uh, Climate Lead Australia will uh, present the Rio Tinto um, analysis. Uh, and then I will dive, dive into the, the first part of the Glencore analysis and Naomi Hogan, our strategic, pro uh, strategic projects lead will, will take over from there. And we will take questions after the Rio Tinto presentation and, in, and then again at the end of uh, the Glencore presentation. So. Um, if you don't hold Glencore and you um, and you want to um, jump off after Rio Tinto, you're more than more than welcome to do that. So, sound climate. Um, this is obviously the second year we, we're seeing these votes uh, on, on this mechanism. Uh, you can see that quote there from uh, from Chris Chris Hone, who I guess established the mechanism in the UK and Europe. Re really, the, it is up to investors what this mechanism is and how powerful it can be. Uh, I think what we've seen through some of the votes in the in in 2021. Uh, were rewarding companies for, for transparency and accountability and for being first movers. And we'd encourage uh, shareholders in 2022 to really assess climate plans uh, on, their, on their merits uh, and you know, how consistent they are with, um, with the Paris Agreement and particularly with limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. We, are, we, we do have a brief and rapidly closing window uh, to, to address climate change. Uh, and I know the UN Secretary General uh, uh, delivered some remarks today, which uh, again reiterated um, the need for action in this decade. Um, and if we can stress one point today, that that is it: that that we do have a limited amount of time ahead of us uh, to take action on climate. And these two companies are really quite imperative uh, in the fight. So, um, at that, I will hand over to Harriet Cater um, to answer that first question. I've just seen pop up in the chat. Yes, the slides will be available. And we'll also post the recording on YouTube. So I um, hope that answers the question. Harriet, over to you. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us this evening or this morning. Um, yeah, as, as evident, I'll be presenting our analysis on Rio Tinto's climate action plan um, that will be informing the vote um, at their upcoming AGMs. Uh, the agenda for today, so we've structured this generally around the net zero company benchmark indicators. Um, we see that as a relatively logical way to approach consideration of a company's sort of climate plan and strategy. Um, the key change that we've made is just elevating the indicator relating to lobbying or climate policy engagement. We have concerns that often that indicator doesn't quite get the attention that it deserves considering the systemic nature that lobbying um, impacts can have um, uh, on sort of climate response in key jurisdictions that companies operate. Okay, first up, so Rio's um, commitment to a say on climate vote is um, three yearly, so they have mirrored BHP on that front. This means that their uh, next vote will not be until 2025. Uh, when Glass-Lewis reviewed BHP's climate plan that informed their sound climate vote last year, they took uh, issue with a three-yearly commitment, emphasising that we're in a rapidly evolving landscape and that three years is enough time for today's standards and expectations to become obsolete. That was absolutely um, relevant for BHP in particular, as we had some significant concerns regarding the appropriateness of their plan. Uh, but it is also relevant to Rio Tinto, and we will go into that. The key difference here with Rio is that in October 2021, the company made a significant climate strategy announcement, um, a significant increase in its ambition. Um, it increased its 2030 scope one and two target from 15% to 50% and brought forward that 15% target to 2025. 
Uh, it also committed $7.5 US billion, US billion dollars, um, to um, decarbonisation and committed to align its capital expenditure to the Paris Agreement, which is no, uh, no mean feat. Um, it, this plan is particularly significant in Australia um, and its implications for grid decarbonisation. Rio Tinto's aluminium smelters that are grid connected here in Australia consume approximately 12% um, of the total um, national electricity market. Um, they, so the, their operations are underwriting the continued operation of at least two coal-fired power stations on the grid. And so that commitment to decarbonise the electricity supply to those aluminium smelters has a direct bearing on um, earlier potential to inform earlier closure of um, major sources of emissions in Australia being coal-fired generation. We've had some questions in um, presenting our analysis on sort of, you know, uh, the key differences between Rio Tinto and BHP. Um, there's been some suggestion that, you know, we're going a bit easy on Rio Tinto compared to BHP. So we thought we might preempt those questions with just highlighting some of the key differences between the company's plans. Um, firstly, um, the 2030 targets. Um, BHP's 2030 target is a 30% reduction by 2030. Whereas, as mentioned, Rio has significantly increased to, um, with the goal to achieve 50% reduction by 2030. Um, as mentioned, Rio has expressly committed to align its capital expenditure with one and a half degrees in the Paris Agreement. No such commitment has been made by BHP. Um, Rio has committed a significantly larger sum of money to addressing decarbonisation across its operations. Um, Rio, uh, BHP um, has still got the $400 million climate investment program that was announced um, in, in July 2019. Um, Rio also um, no more uh, is a fossil fuel producer um, as a consequence of them divesting the, the last of their coal mines in 2018. Um, this isn't... Um, whether, whether Rio got smart or, or whether they were just, they're lucky, um, we're not sort of here to prosecute a decision that was made in 2018. Um, if Rio was proposing to divest its coal mines today, it would be a very different conversation because I think it is generally accepted now that divestment of fossil fuel assets doesn't guarantee um, a lower global emissions. In fact, it can lead to um, um, increased or prolonged emissions due to the um, subject to the intentions of the buyer. In comparison, BHP still is a fossil fuel producer. They are um, operating nine metallurgical coal mines. They still have a thermal coal mine on their books. They um, have a number of proposed new coal mines. They're seeking mine life extension on, on, on one out to, uh, for their metallurgical coal mine out to 2056. And they're still pursuing the mine life extension for the Mount Arthur thermal coal mine. So that's a key point. These are all key points of difference between BHP and Rio. And um, we encourage investors to keep this in mind um, as we progress through um, the presentation and to our recommendation. However, with, with Rio, whilst there is some good news, um, it, it isn't all good news. So um, on the climate policy engagement, Rio is still a member of at least six industry associations that have lobbying practices that are misaligned with the Paris Agreement. Their own recent industry association review found that three, um, three uh, industry associations were partially misaligned with their climate positions. Those associations are the Minerals Count Mineral Council of Australia, the Queensland Resources Council here in Australia, and the National Mining Association in the US. The, uh, the Minerals Council of Australia and the Queensland Resources Council both represent um, the, the coal mine sector and um, are leading advocates um, pushing for expansion of coal mining in Australia. So there are concerns still about the um, negative advocacy that Rio Tinto is funding. Um, but another key question we have for the company relates to um, its positive advocacy. Those of you who are in absence of it, those of you who are familiar with the contents of their 2021 climate change report uh, will have seen multiple references woven throughout the report stating that um, the, you know, that to be able to achieve their um, ambitious targets, it is reliant on appropriate levels of carbon pricing being in place in the key jurisdictions it's operating in. 
And what we're not seeing from Rio Tinto is that real leadership, that advocacy to see those policy settings in place um, that it needs to meet these targets. So that's a, that's a key kind of point of concern um, and something that we are very keen to see change for Rio Tinto and will be a key theme throughout this presentation. Moving now to Rio's uh, actual climate impacts. So this chart um, benchmarks their scope one, two and three emissions against key peers. We can see here that Rio is sort of the leading emitter amongst its peers, um, you know, and, and that its footprint is dominated by scope three emissions. Um, scope three represent 95% of the, the company's total footprint. The processing of iron ore is 62% of the company's total footprint. And of um, its scope one and two emissions, aluminium smelting is the dominant source there, um, representing 50% of emissions. In terms of Rio's um, targets, uh, the, the company does not have a quantifiable scope three target for, it, um, scope, uh, for, for all scope three emissions um, or for um, emissions from steel making. Um, we anticipate with, with the update of the um, Climate Action 100 net zero company benchmark, that that, was this, that that will mean that even though there's been a significant improvement in ambition for its scope one and two targets, the absence of that quantifiable scope three target will mean the company will still um, not be deemed to have um, targets that are consistent with a pathway of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and on that front, in terms of having an ambitious quantifiable, sorry, not ambitious, having a quantifiable scope three target, um, Rio does stand out compared to its peers. Um, now, these peers, I'm not necessarily commenting on the appropriateness or the level of ambition of their scope three targets. It is purely pointing out that, um, that these companies do, in fact, have quantifiable targets for scope threes in place. Um, some of the tasks may be easier. There may be sources that are more within the control of some of these diversified miners. For instance, coal mining, there is a, a, a more direct level of influence that um, coal miners can have over their scope threes. Um, regardless, we just thought it was appropriate to highlight, highlight that. Um, of course, um, Fortescue Metals is the standout here, having, having committed to achieve net zero scope three emissions by 2040. And the bulk of their scope three emissions are um, driven by steel making. Um, so the fact that Rio doesn't have that quantifiable um, scope three target now um, you know, we do note that they have signed on to the International Council of Mining and Metals um, Climate Change Position Statement that was released in September last year. And within that, um, it's um, the signatories to that um, statement um, committed to setting scope three targets, if not by the end of 2023, as soon as possible. Um, this is something that we would be really keen for investors to maintain the pressure on with Rio um, to, to see them um, honouring um, the commitment that they have made here. Moving now to Rio's decarbonisation strategy. Um, so this is uh, their scope one and two strategy out to uh, 2030. Um, uh, the, we've, we've reproduced the waterfall chart that they had in their climate change plan. Um, for those who are um, really keen Rio watchers, you may have seen that the bars within that chart in their plan were all the same size, so they were not representative of the scale of abatement each of the initiatives were going to achieve. So we've done them a favour and um, re redone the chart to show that. Um, and what becomes really clear is the dominant role that the decarbonisation of the electricity supply to those um, aluminium smelters in Australia um, plays in, in, this, in their, their strategy. Um, uh, along with, um, and we've combined that with the Pilbara um, renewable energy rollout as well. So that, that um, represents almost 40% of the total um, target. Um, it's not surprising that electricity decarbonisation is the sort of first port of call here. It's technology that is readily available and, and that it delivers strong commercial returns compared to alternatives. Um, the, the next sort of sizable category of abatement is the MAC projects or the marginal abatement cost curve. So that's a, it's a tool for, for collating and benchmarking, I guess, the abatement and cost of um, implementation of a whole host of different projects. For Rio, their, their MAC curve um, has 63 projects in there that range in, um, on cost from um, negative $110, so they're making money through the implementation of that project, out to a positive um, $250. 
Um, the introduction of a $75 per tonne carbon price will pick up some of the um, negative NPV projects, um, but not all, uh, considering some are, some are as high as $250 a tonne. So that's an example of, you know, an area of Rio's plan that um, would definitely benefit from enhanced um, government policy to, to enable them to, to have the right settings to be incentivized to, to invest in those more uh, less cost effective projects. It's impressive that Rio is using a shadow carbon price of $75 a tonne, but it, it, it's clear that they're seeking to abate some, some difficult areas and there is absolutely a role for government here and they should be advocating for that. Um, the, the last pillar here is other, um, which um, is a sort of slightly curious combination of things. So some energy efficiency initiatives are included in there. Their use of offsets are in there and the um, Elisis technology for the aluminium smelters, which is coming online in 2024. We're not quite sure of their logic for combining those <laughs> items in other. We've asked quite a few questions of Rio around what potential share of that um, abatement offsets will comprise. We have been pretty keen to see um, the company commit to a cap on the role of offsets in this strategy. Um, they have been clear with us that it's their intention to, to follow the mitigation hierarchy and actively avoid offsets if possible. But we do also notice that they are developing a portfolio of offsets projects. So this is definitely an issue that we'll be um, uh, following closely with the company. Um, and then the plan out from 2030 to 2050 um, is still sort of a work in progress. Um, understandably, Rio has left the harder to abate um, sources um, to, to be de de decarbonised in those latter decades. Um, and they're very clear that um, higher carbon prices will be needed to incentivise them to um, to pursue those projects. So again, we come back to the story that um, appropriate, you know, science aligned or Paris aligned policy settings um, are a critical enabler for Rio Tinto to meet their, um, their climate commitments. On scope three, so scope three, um, they, you know, it's a material um, risk for Rio Tinto. Um, as previously flagged, it is dominated by emissions um, from steelmaking. The steel industry is responsible for 8% of global CO2 emissions. Um, there's a whole raft of different studies um, and analyses coming out now about sort of pathways and, and, and a significant number of technologies coming out for decarbonising steel, um, steel making. Um, this chart here is based on the um, pathway in the IEA net zero scenario, um, which states that to achieve net zero steel making, we need to see a 25% reduction in emissions by 2030. Um, and then the bulk of the remaining um, reductions achieved out to 2050. The gap is in, within the IEA net zero scenario. The gap is anticipated to be achieved through the use of carbon capture and storage. So as mentioned, um, um, and any of you who are sort of watching this space, you would be aware that there, there are sort of significant um, rapid changes happening in the steel um, decarbonisation space. Um, and so we, you know, we just really like to sort of insist that whilst it may be quite difficult for Rio Tinto to set quantifiable targets um, that relate to steel making and broader scope threes today, um, what isn't possible in 2022 may well be possible in 2023 due to the rapid developments in the space. So it seems clear to us that Rio has made its case to investors that, you know, it's, it's difficult and, you know, maybe they should, you should go easy on them a bit as a result of scope threes. We do, we appreciate that, you know, we, we want to be pragmatic, but we also don't want to see um, the pressure being taken off too much considering the highly dynamic state, um, state, state of the um, steel decarbonisation race. So the key question then is, um, has a global mining company like Rio Tinto that's achieved record financial results, has it identified all the levers that are within its control um, to influence the rapid decarbonisation of this sector? Within the sort of initiatives that Rio has um, mapped out in its climate change plan, there's sort of two key categories. Um, the first relates to um, engagement with customers um, and a focus on blast furnace optimization. We do have some concerns regarding blast furnace optimization initiatives 
due to the risk um, of locking coal in for several decades. Uh, a recent study has found that um, before 2030, 71% of existing coal-based blast furnaces will require a major um, refurb um, and shutdown. And this does present an opportunity for those steelmakers to consider alternative technologies rather than making those major reinvestments um, and prolonging their, the use of coal-based um, coal um, uh, technologies. The other key theme in Rio's um, uh, scope three initiatives relates to um, uh, the you know technology options for decarbonizing the processing of Pilbara ores. So I'm sure it's not news to you all that iron ore is a significant share of the company's EBITDA at 73%. And of that, 95.5% of iron ore production is in the Pilbara. Um, only, and then the remaining is coming out of Canada. Um, Pilbara iron ore is, is too low grade to be used or processed in current steel, um, green steel pathways. Um, it requires additional processing um, to be purified prior to going through the um, DRI um, EAF um, technology. This introduces additional complexities and costs and is a you know um, emerging risk area for Rio Tinto as the steel industry um, decarbonizes. So we absolutely would be wanting to see a continued and significant focus from Rio on on this issue. What we have also noted that is missing in Rio's commentary um, and commitments and all the initiatives that it has mapped out um, regarding management of scope three and emissions from steelmaking. Again, the opportunity gap relates to the potential influence on um, that they could be um, exerting on, on the policy um, process and governments in this space. Um, in all sort of analyses and, and roadmaps relating to steel decarbonisation, it is always recognised that it is not an easy sector to, to decarbonise and there isn't absolutely a need for government, um, a role for government in establishing green markets increasing incentives and um, subsidies and developing certification schemes and so on. So again, what, what's missing here is that positive advocacy piece from Rio to um, enable um, the swifter decarbonisation of steel, which is something that you know, presents a risk to, to the company. On capital allocation, I think we have touched on this already. Um, where, you know, Rio is um, leading its peers on this front by, by committing that whopping $7.5 billion to its decarbonisation commitments. It's a little bit um, opaque as to how that money will be um, allocated. Um, the CFO, um, Peter Cunningham, stated that a conceptual there was a sort of conceptual roadmap guiding how that money will be spent in the second half of the decade to 2030. Uh, and finally, on climate governance, uh, Rio has undertaken its own sort of board climate competency assessment. Um, it's assessed its board members based on their sort of experience around climate-related threats and opportunities and climate science, the transition and public policy. It has found that six board members meet one or more of those conditions or have, the, have knowledge in those areas. It is unclear which board members they have deemed to have though, that, that, though, that knowledge. And on the remuneration, um, climate change uh, forms 5% of the short-term incentive plan. Um, it, and um, we do note that that doesn't specifically link to the achievement of their um, quantifiable emissions reduction targets. It's a little bit more vague in terms of the actual direct linkage to, to climate change. So to conclude, um, we are, you know, ACC, ACCR's view is that Rio Tinto's um, 2030 scope one and two target, its decarbonisation strategy and capital allocation commitments are significant and worthy of investor support. We're conscious of, you know, celebrating um, that significant um, uplift in ambition that Rio Tinto committed to um, late 2021. Um, so we think that is worthy of support. However, we do think that such, that such support should come with conditions. Our first condition um, is that Rio Tinto commits to providing an annual say on climate vote um, and, and that it presents an enhanced scope, enhanced scope three commitments and strategy um, in 2023, ideally working towards quantifiable targets and timelines that are consistent with the uh, um, um, uh, it's, it's sign on to the um, international mining um, uh, climate policy position. Um, and secondly, um, 
again, that's, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but we really do need to see Rio Tinto to commit to significantly enhancing its policy advocacy um, for Paris aligned climate change policy in the key jurisdictions it's operating in and at an international level. There is a genuine risk the company will not meet its ambitious targets if the policies um, do not change and are not um, aligned with the science. So we would really love to see investors advocate for these outcomes in your engagements with uh, Rio Tinto prior to the AGM. It is our view that should Rio Tinto not be willing to commit to these, um, these conditions, that uh, investors uh, vote against the, the plan at the Sound Climate Vote. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harriet. Um, there is one question in the chat. Uh, what are your views on the coal plant for the Oyu Tolgoi mine and how it fits in this plan and target? So that's referring to the Mongolian copper mine. Uh, I know there was a, there had been a long um, kind of talked about a new coal-fired power station um, that would have been built by in Mongolia to service that mine. Our understanding is uh, from the release in late January that uh, Rio Tinto reached agreement with the Mongolian government to extend their power contract uh, with the Chinese provider uh, to 2026 and possibly 2030. Now, I imagine that probably is coal-fired power as well. Um, I need to clarify that. Um, but there certainly won't be a new coal-fired power station built um, at this point in time. Um, there will be a domestic source uh, constructed at some point in the future, but that is still up for debate what that will be. Um, but that's a fair question. Um, and I think we can... Do, do you know any more about that agreement, Harriet? No, and there's no evidence in the sort of, um, I guess, projection of emissions abatement of kind of... An like you, you see in oil and gas companies when they do their projections for meeting targets, if they're increasing production that pops up, there's no evidence of them contemplating their carbon impacts from that power supply in their outlook. So, um, yeah, I, I guess it is definitely one to, um, to monitor and raise with the company. I am conscious that we are at 9.30 and there are no other questions um, and you guys have got quite a lot to cover with Glencore. I'm happy to unless there's any other Rio questions, or if you think of one, happy to field it after Glencore as well. Right, maybe we can let people think about it for 20, 20 odd minutes. Yeah, um, I will right. share my screen on, uh, on Glencore, give me one moment. Okay, uh, so let's begin by looking at uh, Glencore's revenue and earnings. Uh, we know that Glencore uh, often not necessarily tries to talk down the size of, of, the, of its coal business uh, to in, in terms of its overall business, but the, the number often cited uh, is the revenue from its coal business, uh, which stands at about 9%. Uh, but in terms of uh, EBITDA, um, it's at currently 26%. So in 2020, it was, it was much lower, but with coal prices where they, uh, where they were in 2021, um, the share of EBITDA contributed by the by the energy products business, which is most of that most most of those earnings are coming from coal, uh, jumped back up to twenty six percent. As you can see, over the last five years, with the exception of twenty twenty, uh, where prices dipped through COVID, um, the coal business has generated a significant uh, proportion of Glencore's earnings. What has Glencore committed to so far? Um, so it, it is committed to uh, developing uh, the, the metals that are required in a, in a transition to a low carbon economy, including copper, cobalt, zinc, nickel, et cetera. Um, it has set the, those targets listed there. So 15% by 2026 and 50% by 2035 and net zero by 2050. Uh, in, and there's a, there is a caveat to that. Uh, and that caveat is uh, if, if supportive policy, uh, in a supportive policy environment. Um, so but, uh, Glencore set a baseline of uh, 2019, which uh, we'll get to in a moment, but it was a fairly um, significant year in terms of emissions. Um, the other thing we're looking to see from Glencore, uh, which we haven't seen in the annual report, is, is a restatement of its 2019 baseline to account for its acquisition of Serahon, uh, which it acquired from BHB and Anglo in June last year. So it took over the, the, the remaining two thirds of that mine. Uh, Glencore has, uh, and this is the way we will approach this analysis, uh, through the seven pathways that Glencore has outlined to reduce its operational, uh, its op operational footprint as well as scope three. So those targets apply to both scope three, uh, its operational plus scope three emissions, which kind of sets it apart from its, its mining peers as, as Harriet just uh, reviewed with BHP and, and Rio. Um, 
uh, and we'll go through each of these uh, one by one. So let's start with its uh, its operational footprint. Um, so these missions of a 2020, there are there is emissions data in the 20 uh, in the annual report, which was published late last week, um, but it doesn't break it down um, by uh, by commodity. Um, so the data is not that the emissions uh, are not too dissimilar. Uh, so there was a slight increase uh, in operational emissions uh, in 2021 and a slight decline uh, in scope three emissions. So coal uh, contributes about a third uh, of operational emissions, uh, but the overwhelming majority of the carbon footprint uh, in terms of scope, uh, particularly from the scope three emissions, as you can see there, um, so well over 90% of the entire um, carbon footprint. Glencore's emissions are highly correlated to coal production. As you can see there, a significant drop in emissions uh, in 2020 and 2021. Um, and as, as Glencore has outlined, that is primarily due to, was due to COVID uh, and to some weather related incidents at, at individual mines. Operational emissions bounced back up in 2021. Um, and based on the, the, uh, the forecast for coal production in 2022, so coal production in 2021 was just over 100 million tonnes, I think it was 103 million tonnes. It's forecast to bounce back up to about 121 million tonnes, give or take 5 million tonnes, uh, and that will see a corresponding jump back up in emissions. So in terms of that baseline, you can see how, um, and not, you know, you can kind of accuse Glencore of cherry picking the year at which they've set the baseline, but it was an extraordinary year in terms of production, um, and that obviously makes it easier to meet emissions reduction targets. And even considering that that 2026 target of being 15% below the baseline, I mean, they've already met it in 2020 and 2021. Yet what we're going to see and what we don't know beyond 2022 is what those coal production um, numbers will be. Uh, and that really is the determining, the, the biggest determining factor in terms of Glencore's uh, footprint. Uh, similarly to Rio Tinto, this is, um, this is Glencore's uh, waterfall chart uh, displaying uh, how it intends to reduce emissions over the, over the short term, or over, to, over the long term, really. Um, so you've got max scope one and scope two, so that's the marginal abatement cost curve projects. Um, and the significant reduction in scope three emissions will come about through uh, portfolio, what they call portfolio depletion. So essentially running their, their coal assets down. And Naomi will talk to that um, in a couple of minutes. Uh, just on the so on the Mac um, projects, uh, we'll talk to that quickly here. So this is what uh, Glencore's marginal abatement cost curve looks like. Um, so you can see that 5.6 million tons uh, is NPV positive. That's about 19% uh, of uh, Glencore's operational baseline. Um, so um, it essentially means that um, you know 81%. Uh, of that map curve projects are not NPV positive, you know, particularly at that uh, on the far right hand of that scale there, uh, you get uh, Glencore will require a significant carbon price in order to implement some of those projects uh, and a similar situation to what uh, Harriet just discussed with Rio Tinto. Uh, Glencore isn't a member of industry associations that are actively out there lobbying for a significant carbon price or even ambitious climate policy uh, and that is you know, kind of where the rubber hits the road in terms of, of Glencore's emissions abatement, um, that while it can do those NPV negative projects because, you know, it, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's not going to cost them anything, it's actually going to benefit them in the short term, those harder to abate pro, um, emissions uh, um, are going to need uh, policy certainty, which Glencore is actively lobbying against. We've, we've put this one in just to, um, this is, I guess, the heat map um, from Glencore's uh, climate report. Uh, and it breaks down um, the operational footprint um, by electricity, reductance, diesel, uh, fugitives, et cetera. But we want to talk about fugitives here. We think there is sufficient evidence in Australia that Glencore is underreporting its fugitive methane emissions. Um, so at the moment, they constitute about 14% of their operational footprint, uh, primarily from, uh, from coal mining. Of Glencore's coal production, most of it comes from surface mining rather than underground mining. And the fugitive methane emissions are essentially emitted at the point of blasting. So very difficult or almost impossible to capture. Um, different situation for underground mines where you can capture that methane and, and put it to alternative uses. Um, 
Uh, so as, as we know from the IEA, the Global Methane Tracker um, earlier, well, just, just uh, last month, uh, that the energy sector is responsible for about 40% of total uh, global methane emissions. And uh, the IEA concluded that uh, methane emissions reported by governments are about 70% greater than what uh, is actually being reported. Um, so a massive underreporting issue. Uh, and given the size of Australia's coal mining and gas uh, extraction um, industries, uh, Australia is probably a, a fairly significant offender on that front. Uh, most of the methane uh, emissions reporting is calculated using uh, emissions factors rather than on the ground measurement or satellite measurement. Uh, and then more recently, uh, we've seen research uh, from a Dutch group uh, which identified two of Glencore's mines in Queensland as super emitters. So the Hale Creek mine and the Oakey North mine. And uh, one of those mines alone um, was estimated to account for 20% of Australia's national methane emissions uh, in a single year, despite just producing 1% of Australia's coal. That's the Hale Creek mine. The Oakey North mine, um, uh, similarly over, uh, over what you'd expect, uh, nowhere near at that level, uh, but that data is coming out of satellite uh, data. So. Uh, we're not the thing. Uh, the, the thing that we're trying to explain here is that we're not seeing those uh, those super emitting mines flow through to Glencore's emissions reporting. So we we've you know we're we're asking the company to essentially to please explain um, how these uh, how these mines are being accounted for or the methane emissions from these mines, and how that's flowing through to its disclosures. And more importantly, what uh, what Glencore intends to do about that. Um, to, to um, both to in terms of measurement as well as abatement. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Naomi Hogan, um, ACCR Strategic Projects Lead, uh, and she'll discuss um, the next couple of slides. Thanks, Dan. Great to be with you all today. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, please. We were keen to jump into, thank you, uh, jump into the statements by the company, particularly uh, regarding their position Firstly, not to dispose of their fossil fuel assets, particularly their coal assets, um, which does seem to be a positive. Uh, and we note their comment uh, around managing the decline of the fossil fuel portfolio, uh, which uh, specifically for Australia uh, is coal um, and their footprint predominantly in thermal coal. And what we've found is that we're concerned that uh, managing the decline is not necessarily what's happening here in Australia and we're seeing many expansions and even new coal mines. Uh, so if you look at coal production uh, to date, we can see that the vast majority of uh, Glencore's coal production is in Australian thermal coal, uh, also seeing a fair bit in South African thermal and coking in Australia as well. Uh, and as Dan mentioned, we're likely to see a jump back up to 121 megatons in 2022. This is the list here in Australia of mines since the 2019 announcement uh, that we've seen Glencore either uh, pushing for assessment or have had approved. Uh, and our concern is that this pipeline of projects is not around managing the decline of coal, certainly not in Australia, uh, but in seeing a continued um, burning and mining of coal for many decades to come. Uh, so in total, we're seeing new capacity in megatons per annum there um, since 2019 of around 130 megatons um, and in an equity share basis for Glencore, that is about 105 megatons per annum. And this next slide we've tried to explain um, and have a look at what that looks like out to 2050 or even to 2067. So Dan, if we go to the next slide, we can see a visual representation of Glencore's mines in Australia. Uh, so of this uh, graphic here, uh, the only mines, sorry, Dan, if you could just jump back a slide. All right, so this is a graphic of all of Glencore's mines here in Australia. And we wanted to understand what does that look like out through the future? Are they actually uh, managing a decline in their coal production from here in Australia? What we found is that the three mines that they mentioned in their climate report, uh, progress report for 2021, Integra, Liddell and Newlands closing in 2023 um, may be seen as a positive step. However, uh, we have many other mines in the pipeline. 
In the blue there, you can see the current closure dates for each of those currently operating mines. Uh, and the volume of um, equity saleable coal there is based on their 2021 or 2020 production. So we've just kept that going. Um, what we see in the orange there is currently under assessment for Glencore. So Glencore has got uh, either through the New South Wales government, uh, Queensland state government, um, or a federal assessment uh, to see those mines expanding. We've got the Valeria coal mine there, uh, which is a new greenfield coal mine here in Australia. And the grey area there is the Wandoan coal mine, which is currently shelved by the company, uh, but is unclear. And certainly if we look out to 2040, we're not seeing a drop at all in coal production coming from Glencore. Glencore have made statements around particularly their 2035 50% emissions reduction target as being in line with both the IEA or IPCC scenarios. Um, but when we look at the proportion of Glencore's emissions as a company that are generated from their coal business, we're concerned that the decline is not uh, fast enough to match what's required. So here in the yellow, we've, we've got the IEA net zero emissions coal production uh, rates out to 2035. And we can see that uh, that pathway requires a significant drop in coal production, uh, which we don't see by a target that uh, would take it to 50% by 2035, if Glencore could in fact make that target. This maps um, the 1.5 report by the IPCC. They mapped 85 different pathways, uh, but what we can see is the median in the high overshoot range is the black line there. The yellow line is the low overshoot. Uh, and what we see by 2035 is that a 50% reduction for coal in those scenarios is also not enough to be where we need to be uh, internationally to meet that Paris Agreement to keep within 1.5 and to avoid the worst warming. So I'll just jump back to Dan to talk through some of the um, capital allocation. Uh, thanks, Naomi. Um, so the chart there on the right uh, is from uh, Glencore's climate report. It, it suggests that no further expansionary capex will be allocated to energy, um, to its energy business, or well, essentially its coal business uh, over the period 2022 to 2024. Um, now, that assumes uh, that uh, recent history will be upended, really, uh, and, cause, and, and goes against uh, the plans that Naomi has just outlined um, with that kind of raft of uh, new and expanded coal mines. Um, but as you can see uh, from the two highlighted rows there, um, expansionary capex towards the coal business um, has increased, um, well, well, increased to 2020 and a slight dip in 2021. But... Um, it is well above $100 million and, and, well above, and over $150 million for the last three years. And it kind of defies belief that, um, that Glencore could say that it, it's not going to allocate expansionary capex to coal, um, given the projects that it has on its agenda. Um, and as you can see there, that's, uh, that percentage there is, is coal is making up 16% um, of Glencore's overall capex. Yeah, we, we, I guess there's a bit of um, it, the questions need to be asked about um, that capital allocation plan. Again, um, you, you've seen parts of this slide uh, earlier um, in, in Harriet's presentation, but Glencore has not disclosed a budget for investment in climate solutions. Um, compared to its peers, um, it is, is, is severely lacking. Um, obviously, Rio Tinto and Fortescue have allocated uh, many billions of dollars uh, to reducing emissions, uh, particularly in the, the operational footprint. Um, and even and, and even BHP's 400 million um, kind of overshadows what Glencore has has you know simply not disclosed a budget for it. E even if you uh, you know assume that that um, you know there won't be expansionary capex towards coal, uh, Glencore isn't allocating the capital required to reduce its operational footprint over the short to medium term. So one of the things that Glencore has spoken to in their climate reports is the opportunities in carbon capture, utilisation and storage, mainly through the CTS Co project uh, that they are putting forward in Queensland. Our concern when we've dived into that proposal, uh, firstly, it's not proven and it's certainly early days uh, with that proposal. But even if it was successful, when we look at the abatement opportunity from that project, uh, as you can see from the graphic here, it's a tiny proportion 
uh, of the emissions from the coal-fired power station that it is partnering with and absolutely a minuscule proportion of the emissions from Glencore here in Australia. So the amount of uh, publicity and uh, uh, conversation within the climate plan doesn't seem to match with the, the problem that Glencore has ahead in terms of the abatement challenge. We'd like to see far more transparency in the climate reports from Glencore, and there are many opportunities to do that. Uh, so we could see far more transparency around the emissions on each mine site. Uh, we could learn more about scope three emissions by commodity. We need to know more about the methods used to measure and capture fugitive methane emissions from these mines. Certainly that is going to start being a bigger issue when it's more public with the amount of satellites that are now tracking this issue. Uh, more detailed commentary on emissions performance, key drivers, increases, decreases. We have very little information at the moment. Uh, further detail on the assessment of physical risks and the vulnerabilities across jurisdictions and mine sites to acute and chronic weather events, which we're already experiencing here Australia, in Australia and is set to become much worse. And I'll touch on this point now, improved assessment of the industry association's advocacy with uh, alignment to the goals of the Paris Agreement. What we see on Glencore, and this research is based uh, very much from Influence Map, who have ranked Glencore as the eighth most obstructive company blocking climate policy action globally. Uh, so Glencore has scored a D minus for its climate policy footprint. It's one of the few companies in the top 25 whose climate policy footprint is predominantly associated with indirect advocacy in favour of more thermal coal. And we see that through Glencore and through all of the industry associations that they fund namely the Minerals Council, the New South Wales Minerals Council and the Queensland Resources Council. Um, we also see uh, that continued advocacy and not wanting to see action on climate change and to keep coal in the energy mix. And Glencore has signalled its intent to exit the World Coal Association. Uh, here are some examples. Just recently in a by-election here in New South Wales, this photo was taken near where I live in the Hunter Valley. Uh, the candidates found themselves at a Glencore coal mine uh, to announce the by-election and their candidates and to talk about coal remaining king in the Hunter. Um, it's very mixed up in our politics here in Australia and certainly here in New South Wales. Um, and we see there uh, the influence map report with Glencore. Uh, this is a list of the, the industry associations for which Glencore is a member. And as you can see, they're having an ongoing uh, and negative impact on climate policy here in Australia. Uh, and that is preventing some of the positive advocacy and the, the climate policies that we need in order uh, to aid the, the transition and the decarbonisation required now by uh, these companies. And I might just skip through a few slides here. We're seeing uh, this advocacy around COVID and again, needing more thermal coal mines, um, again, more advocacy. Uh, so if we just quickly go through, um, we absolutely need to see climate votes based on Parrot's alignment, uh, which we don't believe we're seeing here with Glencore. Uh, we don't want shareholders tacitly approving Glencore's coal expansion plans here in Australia. Um, there are significant new and expanding predominantly thermal coal mines here. Even if uh, they were to meet their targets, we're concerned that by 2035, uh, the, the decline in coal is not enough to align with a 1.5 degree pathway. Uh, despite those lower emissions uh, in, the, in the last year, we're seeing that bump up again for 2022. We haven't seen what Glencore intends to invest to reduce emissions, and we need to see a lot more information there. We're concerned around fugitive emissions being underreported, concerned talking up uh, CTS Co is not um, going to provide the abatement needed, and very concerned about the ongoing obstructive climate policy advocacy. Thank you. I'll pass back to you, Dan. Uh, thanks, Naomi. At that point, I will stop sharing. Um, and I did notice that there is uh, one question. Uh, who are Glencore's customers? Won't they need, uh, won't they all need coal from somewhere? Um, well, I guess the answer in the short term is, is yes, but in the medium to long term, if we are to, to meet a one and a half 
uh, degree alignment then um, from that modeling that was on uh, in one of those slides from the IEA that uh, that coal, coal use needs to decline fairly rapidly. Um, and we have seen those commitments, uh, particularly from Japan and Korea. Um, and, and they are two of uh, Glencore's major customers, um, into, uh, major buyers of, of thermal coal. Um, and similarly, um, we're, we're starting to see uh, more ambition coming out of China as well. Um, so they are the three uh, largest customers of Australian thermal coal. Um, and we've seen those shifts from Japan and Korea already. We'd obviously like to see more ambition from China, um, but um, uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, There's another question there. I can yep. um, uh, read it for you if you want. So if they, being Glencore, cancel Valeria, would that be sufficient given Wondoan has been shelved already? We're also seeing a large expansion in Hunter Valley Coal Operations, which is a joint venture with Yan Coal. Uh, we're also seeing the Glendale expansion, continued operations. They are massive expansions that Glencore is planning now uh, that would have significant footprints well past 2040. Um, so I think if Glencore was sticking to the plan uh, to, to see a managed decline of their coal portfolio, they wouldn't be... Uh, striving for those very large expansions right now, uh, taking them well out into the 2040s. Uh, we have a question on Rio, which I'm happy to feel just around whether ACC, ACCR, we, whether we think they'll meet their um, ambitious targets for 2030 and 2050. Um, I think we've sort of made the message pretty clear that, um, you know, uh, certainly for things like ele electricity decarbonisation, that that should be um, achievable initiatives. But there are a number of um, emission sources within their portfolio for which Rio themselves recognise higher carbon prices and policy measures will be needed to enable um, their decarbonisation. So, you know, it's a, a lovely segue. Thanks for the question to bring us back to one of the key messages from our analysis being that if Rio is genuinely committed to meeting those targets, we absolutely we have to see them being on the front foot and pushing for the necessary policy settings to facilitate them. I wouldn't mind like Dan or Naomi just on the kind of vote um, for Glencore's sound climate vote um, last year, it got sort of significant support. Um, would you like to, I think we might have touched on it, but just again, hypothesize on why, why that, why that happened? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, Glencore was one of the first companies to commit to a sound climate vote. Uh, it, it received 94% support uh, at its AGM last year. Um, you know, obviously we don't know why um, most investors supported that, um, that motion, but from the proxy advice, um, it was pretty clear that there was a, you know, a reward for being a first mover and for, you know, that transparency and accountability. Um, and little assessment of whether Glencore's plans were Paris aligned. Um, so, uh, you know, with his opportunity to vote against the, pro the on the on the progress against the plan, um, particularly with that you know very long list of, of coal mine expansions as well as that uh, the new mine Valeria uh, and the on ongoing advocacy and the kind of you know inadequate commitments around reducing operational emissions uh, or at least detail around operational emissions um, we, we, we think it warrants a vote against. Add to that Dan and with regard to the previous question we also see Glencore both in the state of New South Wales and Queensland seeking uh, approval for new exploration licenses for coal uh, so we're still seeing energy from the company going in to open up new areas um, for new potential mines that aren't even on the books yet, uh, which is obviously not the direction that we would like to see. Uh, there was one final question. Will the slides be shared? And, and the answer is yes, we will We will post them on the website and um, we'll look at um, distributing those to, to who registered for the, uh, for the webinar. But uh, we'll give you a two minute early mark. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. Um, and please do read our materials. Um, and uh, you know, if you are, uh, we obviously present all of this this information in our briefings, which are on our website. Um, but we will distribute those links as well as the slides from tonight. Thank you very much for joining.